Hello everyone. This is a briefing on the first assessment for Design Practice 8, Propose. This assessment is called the Interiors Phase 1 and it's worth 8%. In this assessment task, what we'll do is first of all, zoom in. And this is a chance for all of you to have a first go at exploring and communicating the interior spaces of your scheme and the mood of these interior environments. The mechanism that we'll use to do that is a storyboard. And this will entail two things that form the deliverables of the assessment. The first is that you'll be creating six A3 panels with perspectives on them, and these communicate the interior spaces that you've chosen. The second part of the assessment is six A3 supporting panels, and the purpose of these is to communicate the mood or the atmosphere of those interior spaces that you've selected. The broad focus of the whole assessment is on communicating now interior experiences. Consider the audience that we're asking you to present to and the mode of presentation. And all of this is outlined in the course outline. So this is an external client presentation. It's a graphic pinup onto the wall and you'll have three minutes to go through the key points um, of your proposal. What we're asking is that you think about DP7 and DP8 in this assessment and throughout DP8 as a course, um, in terms of interlinked courses that form your proposal for the project as a one year experience. So think in this assessment, how has your research into site, stakeholders, users and program and the formation of the strategic brief in DP7, how is that going to inform the interior experiences that you're communicating to us through your storyboard presentation? We're asking that you really leverage and deepen this research rather than just think, okay, research is done and now I'm going to go into design decision making. Think about a constant toing and froing between spatial decisions and research. So, to begin this assessment, you'll see that we're asking you to communicate six key spaces. So, how do you choose which those spaces are? The first thing, <coughs> excuse me, is to consider which spaces in your project as a whole really exemplify your narrative for the interior experiences of the proposal. And by narrative, we might mean the kind of story that you're trying to tell us, the design idea, the design intent. You will see in the course outline that there are six spaces that we are asking you broadly to choose from. And I'll just run through these now. The first is the main arrival to the La Perouse headland, and this will be an exterior uh, perspective. The second is that we ask you to look at a principal programmatic space. And if you see to the left here, this would be an interior environment from either the exhibition museum space or the community civic center. So within that principal programmatic space, you need to communicate to us one, an entry or reception area, and two, one of the main areas within these zones. So if, for example, you were choosing the exhibition um, museum space, the entry or reception might be the main welcome point. So in this space, there may be an information center, there may be a kind of central gathering zone, there may be a retail space off to the side. The main area, again, within the exhibition museum space might be, for example, um, a performance, a, a series of performance centers, which I know a number of you are doing in your projects. So the performance centers might mean that you have three areas that are interconnected and there may be some toilets that come off the side of those. 
If we go down to the second, so the principal programmatic space two, again, this needs to be from either an, the exhibition museum space or the community civic centre. And again, it should be an interior space. For this, we're just asking you to communicate to us one main area. So if the first programmatic space was the exhibition museum centre, the second programmatic space would be the community slash civic centre. And a main area here might be a central gathering space. It might be a series of workshop areas um, and talking spaces, for example. If we go down to point number five, auxiliary programmatic space three and a main area from here. This again refers to an interior space and this can be from anywhere in the project. So the way that you might think about this is again, which spaces really exemplify that core narrative that you're trying to tell? And also which spaces might, um, might you like to use in your portfolio to, to kind of profile your skills? and to lead you in a particular direction um, in industry. So that might mean, okay, I'm really interested in working within residential interiors, so I'm go or, or hospitality-based interiors. So I'm gonna select to showcase the accommodation component of my project. Or I'm really interested in moving into retail. So I'm going to showcase the retail space, the retail slash visitors center that you enter when you first approach La Perouse headland. The final component, so point six, is a principal circulation element. Again, this should be interior and it can be from where anywhere in the project proposal. A number of you are looking at um, ramps and kind of large scale uh, staircases that kind of cut through the site. This could form a principal circulation element. It might be a, a staircase and a lift that forms a central kind of spine to your community center, for example. Feel free to ask myself or your tutor if you have questions on all of this, and we'd really like to close your decisions here in week one. So again, <clears throat> what you'll have are six A3 perspectives communicating these six key interior spaces. And when you're starting to craft those perspectives, we want you to think, what is the design intent for the experience of each space? So what kind of space are you intending to create? The way that you'll communicate this is via a perspective image. You'll need some titles or notes, and you'll need to have a diagram locating the position of that perspective within the overall project. Think about how you communicate each of the key spaces and the design intent for each of the key spaces um, in isolation. And here we can see both image and text to support. But also about how you communicate those six key spaces and the design intent um, interlinking those six key spaces as a whole. So we're thinking about the individual and the whole. What we're asking for is you to create these perspectives using black and white, kind of grayscale only, and line drawing. The intent of this is that we're asking you to think about the interior experience in terms of the volume, scale, proportion, and the experience of light or tone, rather than getting into really nitty gritty details or materiality. So we're not looking for this. We don't need colour, we don't need materiality, and we don't need fine detail. What we are looking for you to show are walls, floors and ceilings, openings and their thicknesses, so the thicknesses of openings, the thicknesses of walls, floors and ceilings, major fixed elements. So this would mean things like staircases, ramps, um, banquette seats, uh, built-in built uh, say benches and reception desks, 
um, but it would not mean loose furniture such as dining chairs in the cafe, um, tables in the cafe, uh, floor lamps um, in the accommodation areas, for example. It does mean showing light and shade. And for this assessment, just showing natural light and shade. So we're not worrying about artificial light at this stage. So let's take a look at an example of this. If we imagine for a second that our intent for the overall project is to continually link interior environments to the kind of expansive um, landscape that you see on La Perouse's headland, be that in a really overt way or in more subtle ways, then what I've tried to do here is to choose a, a, choose a space in my project which really explicitly demonstrates that relationship. So if you have a look at this sketch here below, um, what I'm imagining in my head is that this is the back of the cable house kind of here, and that this area from kind of this line onwards is that rear landscape that kind of slopes upwards in that direction. So what I'm trying to do here is just to sh start to shape the form of that space and demonstrate that relationship between the interior and the landscape. So we've got here, um, if we go back to that list, a ceiling plane that starts to curve upwards and reach out, kind of mimicking the um, form of the land. We've got here um, wall plane that kind of stops here and then another wall plane here, which is just, I'm thinking, a really kind of whimsical curtain that flaps in the wind. We've got no defined um, material junction between interior or exterior. And we've got this simple kind of bench seat that begins in the interior space and projects out and into the landscape, um, connecting those two areas. We've then got an opening, and probably what I'd need to do, show a little bit more clearly is the thickness of that opening, that starts to bring light down into that kind of courtyard space. What we want you to do then is to layer this space and the physical components of the space by showing the users and implying the usages of each of the key, um, the six key spaces. So this goes back to one of the core components of design for the built environment of interior architecture and of DP8. And, and that's that we as designers really need to have a very sophisticated understanding of the relationship between the decisions we make in forming the built environment and the way that impacts upon the users of these environments. That, that relationship needs to be continually kind of evaluated in each step of the design process um, because at the end of the day we're designing for people and we're designing in DP8 for a specific group of people that you've started to research and understand in DP7. One of the strategies for connecting this back to human experience, um, in this assessment at least, is to frame your perspectives so that you are taking us as the viewer into the space. And what we're asking you to do here is to take each perspective at eye level. So this means that we're not asking for perspectives or axonometrics like this. We really want to, again, be inside your space. So you can see with this perspective that eye level is kind of here. You can see in yellow. And what we'd like to do with this perspective would be to start to add people. So I'd like to see that, you know what, you can sit here on this bench and you could maybe fit, you know, five or six people. They could face each other. They could be sitting on their own. They could be sitting in groups. Someone might be able to lean against the wall here. 
could have another person over here. So there's a depth to it. So you start to see, okay, this is a fixed element that has been designed with some depth so that you can sit on it in various ways and, and you can really impact upon the behavior of people through these detailed decisions that you're making about the space and its formation. We go on. We'd really also like you to take us to the place of La Perouse. And, and this is about really understanding the context of the site in both a physical and a social sense. So remember that this is an adaptive reuse project, and this is a really common typology of project for interior architects to work on. So for me, what I find very important to consider in these projects is relationships. And you'll see that the assessment criteria building on DP7 looks a lot at relationships and how you're demonstrating a really considered and complex ability to kind of nuance these. So consider in your perspectives how are you communicating and how are you developing relationships between extant and proposed structures, between interior environments and exterior environments, between built form and landscapes. So if we go back again to this perspective and we put we put people in, and let's say this guy's you know reading the newspaper, and these people here are talking to each other, and these people here are playing chess, let's say, and these people here maybe are standing and talking in a small group, then. How does the landscape play into that? So if we think about this as the back of the cable house, what if the landscape started to rise up as it does and start to come into the interior? So let's use some of those rocks that are out on the landscape. And maybe they start to come down into this of courtyard space and maybe they even start to come into the interior and maybe then you add people and you say well you know what people could be sitting up here and they could be sitting over here and they could be sitting over here sitting on this rock here you really start to populate the space and again show the users and, and imply the usage if we think again about that, that, that idea of relationships here, we're linking kind of interior to exterior environments. What about extant and proposed? So if we imagine that this back wall over here is the existing rear facade of the cable house, we might start to look in real, real detail at, well, how did Barnett design those cornices? And what about the skirting boards? And then how do we follow that language through in the detailing of our proposed additions? So if this, the cornices were quite detailed, do we continue, let's say, the height of the cornice, but in a very simplified way to kind of frame that ceiling plane? For example, do we raise this bench so that you have a kind of shadow gap that aligns with the height of the skirting board on the original um, cable house uh, interior facade? So we want to see that you're starting to consider um, the details of the built structures and how these relate to the details of your proposed um, forms. So if we have a look here at some student examples, um, hopefully this helps to demonstrate some of the uh, key components that we're looking for in assessment one. So here we've got Marvin Medjikar, and you can see that the first perspective is of the arrival to Goat Island. 
and the second is to the interior of a working uh, of a workshop space. I think what Marvin has done well has shown is to show the users and the usages of the space and to start to hint at the mood of the space through tone. So consider that when you're using um, shades of, of the grayscale spectrum. Zara Bates um, was quite effective at showing us again the context of the built structures existing on the site. So you'll see that she's picked up on the structural detail of the roof trusses and some of the material detail of the claddings, <coughs> excuse me, on, on the roofs of the existing structures of the site. And then again, she's hinted at light and tone, users and usage through shading and through, um, in her case, Photoshopped uh, people. The final part of the perspectives is that we need you to create a diagram that locates your perspective in the overall scheme. And you'll see here in Kana Rumerals that she has used the diagram in the bottom area of the panels and some simple text to say this is where you are. She's kind of been quite playful in her titles, you can see at the top here, in kind of helping to communicate where you are in the scheme. So welcome to Techno Trashed. So we know that this is the arrival, welcome. And her project was called Techno Trashed. Experience the Queen. So the Queen's magazine was one of the existing built structures on the site. So think about how you use that perspective image, text, typography and diagram to tell us where we are in your scheme and what the design intent is for that spatial experience. Marvin Medjica um, kind of builds on this by again showing the diagram, having some simple text and just some key points you can see that outline the usage and the design intent of the space. This first assessment is really an opportunity to start from the very beginning to experiment with the graphic strategies you'd like to use for your final presentation to communicate the, the narration of the design intent of your project. So start to play with these now. And you know, the possibilities for this are endless and really depend on the story that you're trying to tell and the intent of the project as a whole. Um, a lot of students last year used SketchUp as a basis and some went very digital. Um, Leo Wang uh, used hand sketches throughout to really start to communicate kind of light and shade. Um, we're really open to the possibilities and we'd like you to really start to test what those might be. Uh, week one is the opportunity to talk through some of those strategies with both your demonstrators and the tutors. Okay, so that kind of closes the discussion around the perspective element of the assessment. I'd now like to talk about the second part of the assessment, which are the six supporting A3 panels. To recap, the aim of those panels is to communicate to us the atmosphere or the mood for each of the six um, key spaces that you've chosen to represent. Same as the perspectives. Think firstly, what is the intent, the design intent for the space that I am communicating? What story am I trying to tell? What experience am I trying to create? And how does that experience really intrinsically relate to the intended usage and users of the space? The vehicles that you'll use within the supporting panels to communicate this information are images to evoke that experience, short descriptive text, and project hashtags. So last year, the students were asked to develop a project name. This year, we're gonna say, okay, well, if you were to put this onto Instagram and communicate 
your project and the key facets of your project. Again, narrate that story of your project. What would the three hashtags be for the project? And then we'd like you finally to add your name. So if we talk first of all about the images, what should the images be? Really the images should be uh, precedents that describe your intended materials, atmosphere or mood, fittings and finishes, um, light, tactile elements, and you should be referencing each of those images. Uh, this is an example from Maya Guppy Hall from last year. So again, she was, was going for a kind of hyper real um, uh, experience that in some areas was quite light. Um, so it was really about this kind of overexposed light. And then you'll see in some of her other panels, it was about this, this kind of dark, um, really sensorial experience. So I think her images were very effective in combination with um, just, just short text at describing to us the intent of that experience. <coughs> Kate Riley used images as well as short titles on each of the images to talk about whether she was referring to the form or the spatial composition of the environment versus the materiality she also started to tie in um, climatic elements. So some of her spaces referred to water, some to wind, some to sunlight. And so in each of her panels, she pulled it back to that element that um, she was referring to in the space. The descriptive text, how much to do, what to say. So the descriptive text really is a support to the images. So again, it should be describing your intent for materials, mood, atmosphere, key finishings and furnishings, light, tactile elements, all within the kind of umbrella of the design intent for that space and for the project as a whole. Here we have Kana Rumerol. Um, similar to Maya Guppy Hall, I think extremely evocative images that give us a clear sense of the experience of the mood of that space. And then if you take some time to read through the text, you'll see that she's clearly starting to link the design intent for the space with some of the um, strategies, so the spatial strategies that she's using to kind of see that intent through. What we're specifically asking for in this assessment this year is for you to reflect back on the research that you did into precedence in DP7 and make specific reference to an application from one of those precedents to the formation of your six key spaces. That reference might be in the form of an, of an image, it might be in the form of um, an explanation in your text, it might be in the form of a verbal pointer to those elements in your presentation itself, um, and evidence of how you've applied that finding to the formation of your space in the perspective. <coughs> Finally, we'd like you to add your name and three Instagram hashtags. So if you think about this project and again, the story, the design intent, the narrative, how would you communicate that? How would you brand your project? What would be the three terms you would use to kind of in a snapshot, get the idea of the project across? So you'll see here an example from last year from Zara Bates of how the presentation might read as a whole. We have six perspectives uh, titled for clarity with um, diagrams that show the position of that perspective in the scheme as a whole, short descriptive text, and then underneath all of these six supporting panels that start to describe the mood or the atmosphere of the project. What's slightly different this year is that you guys will be, uh, instead of uh, titling the project, you'll be proposing three Instagram hashtags that brand the project and the project narrative. And what we want you to do is to think, if you walked away and you were unable to present this, is the design intent and the spatial experience explicit? Is it clear? 
So some checkpoints here. Look at the image, show it to a friend, ask them to describe to you the space and to hypothesize as to the intent behind that space. Second, then show them the titles, the keys, the hashtag, and see if their reading of the space is different or if it's enriched through those. Finally, get them to stand back 1500 millimeters from your presentation and see whether they can read it. Okay, this is part of the assessment criteria, so it's really important one to consider. So if we go through the assessment criteria, you'll see in the course outline that design intent and interior development makes up 70% of the mark. And I'll just talk through some of those um, points now. What we've got here are just the components that are bold in the course outline. You'll see that there are other criteria, but it's up to you to go through those in the outline yourself. The first bold element is consideration of design intent. So what is design intent? Is there an idea? Is there a story? Is there a driver that is pushing the spatial and atmospheric decisions that you're making in each of the spaces and in the project as a whole? Second criteria, is there evidence of considered spatial experiences that are responsive to the use and users of the space? So what we want you to think about is how you're making spatial and atmospheric decisions that are explicitly linked to the typology and the users of the space. An example here, if you were saying to me, I'm designing a community centre or a kind of knockabout drop-in drop -in space for the local community. What I've chosen is gold-plated um, bench tops and Carrara marble uh, flooring. I would probably say that although those two things potentially work together, I think it's, they are really inappropriate choices for the intended use and users of the space. So I think there really needs to be a constant connection between those things. The third criteria, is there a considered and complex relationship between new and extant structures? You will have seen this criteria in DP7 and this will follow through DP8. So one of the core kind of um, focus points for interior architects, apart from that kind of human spatial relationship, is relationships between extant and proposed structures. Often our work focuses on dealing with existing buildings and adaptive reuse projects. So we need to be really sophisticated at um, nuancing these spatial relationships. And we'd like to see that evidenced in assessment one and in all of the assessments throughout this course. The fourth is, is there a considered and complex um, relationship between scale and proportion of spaces? So this is really looking at those basic compositional elements of space. Have you taken a sophisticated approach in forming the space itself? And finally, is there a considered approach to atmosphere and mood? So have you really thought about, well, I've, this is my design intent. These are the users and uses, usages, and I'm going to choose these materials and these fittings to respond to those things. The final 30% of the assessment is based on your crafting and professionalism. And you'll see that this comes through in all of the assessments um, in DP8. So in assessment one, what we're looking at is have you used effective graphic strategies to communicate design intent? This means, <clears throat> have you thought about the line weight, the line type, the type of shading, the type of font, the size of the font, the layout of the panel, the type of person that you show, the type of object that they're holding, the, the mechanism for showing that person, the graphic mechanism for showing that object, all in relation to the intent for this space.
right? So there are different methods that, that we'd really like you to start experimenting with so that you can form a clear graphic language that you develop throughout DP8 and then use in your final presentation. And then finally, are you demonstrating a pre-professional level of design and crafting? Is there care in the crafting? Could we send this to a client and charge for it? So that kind of summates the um, main components of assessment one. What we'd like you to do for week one, day one, so for this coming Monday, is to draft six perspectives of the key spaces. This means you'll have to choose those six key spaces and start to think about how you'll communicate those. We're really easy as to how you do this. It can be in SketchUp, it might be in Photoshop, it might be by hand, it might be using pen, it might be using pencil, it might be using chalk, you might use a photocopier. Um, start to experiment with the way that you communicate and the spaces and extent of spaces that you're showing. Good luck and we really look forward to seeing you all on Monday.